Hi, welcome to the YouTube channel. My name is Joel Ashton and in this video I want to bring you the single most important piece of advice as to how you can attract wildlife into your own garden, doesn't matter where you are around the world, but I'm going to break it down into three parts because for me I think it's important to include all the finer details and I don't want to rush this video and the time lapse I did of this video just four months ago has already had 300,000 views on YouTube, which is absolutely phenomenal. And the amount of requests I've received from people all around the world saying, how do you do it? Can I see an informative video as to how you create your wildlife ponds? So here it is. This is the uh, icing on the cake, if you like. This is the complete definitive how-to guide as to how to install your own wildlife pond with all the plants you would need if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Again, these vary slightly depending on where you are around the world. Uh, so do get in touch and I'll try and help you out on that if you are looking to build one of these in a different country. Uh, I've had a lot of people from India, for example, try and uh, get in touch about this. And I think it's brilliant and they're, they're, there's so much enthusiasm for people building a wildlife pond in their own back garden. But I hope that my experience for the last 15 years will give you all the knowledge you need to be able to do this yourself. But of course, I am here on hand. So do leave some comments in the comments below if you've got any questions. And hopefully I'm on nearly my 100th wildlife pond now. Uh, that will be enough of a reassurance for you that these things do work. Some people comment and say, oh, it looks murky. And of course, the video in the time lapse I did, I didn't have a chance to go back and film afterwards to show when the water had cleared. The oxygenating plants do clear the water nicely and these are a brilliant resource for so much wildlife. So trust me, this is a tried and tested technique many, many times. And uh, I'm now going to hand you over to myself to explain about just exactly how you can create your own wildlife pond. Stay tuned, don't skip through it because there's snippets of information all the way through and don't forget to watch the next two videos I say I'll do it in three parts so that you have all the knowledge that I've gained over the last 15 years. Thanks for watching, I'll see you soon. My name's Joel Ashton and in this video I want to show you the single most important habitat you can look to put into your own garden if you want to increase the biodiversity and attract as much wildlife as, as possible to your own garden. Now that of course is a wildlife pond and for those of you that aren't fortunate enough to have your own garden or maybe you've just got a balcony then I've done a previous video on how to make a wildlife barrel or a mini wildlife pond within a barrel if you like uh, and I'll put a link to that at the end of this video because they're great because of course you can uh, take them with you when you move or like I say if it's a rented property you can't dig in the ground or you've only got a balcony then they're fantastic but in this video I want to show those of you that have got your own garden and can dig into the ground how to make a wildlife pond and we're going to look at the best place to put your pond uh, the depths and measurements that you need to consider when, when creating your pond all the right sort of plants you can use uh, and really hopefully all the tools you're going to need to to make this wonderful habitat in your own back garden now if we look at the situation or the setting of the pond if you like when you you look at your back garden it depends whether you've got north facing or south facing garden ideally if you can um, you want to get as much sun as possible on your pond now they will work in semi shade and they're absolutely they're, they're fine with that but of course one thing you must consider is uh, the leaf litter that you may get from overhanging tree branches in the autumn can really cause some uh, fertility issues in the pond and that rotting vegetation through the autumn and winter months can really turn the water black and actually kill off a lot of the wildlife. Um, so if you can, uh, position your pond away from any overhanging tree branches 
Um, and sometimes people say, well, can I net the pond? Yes, of course, you can net the pond and stop the leaves falling in. Uh, and usually, of course, it's only for four or five weeks when the actual uh, majority of the leaves are falling. But, of course, then do take that netting off uh, if you can so that you allow birds still need to bathe and drink throughout the winter months. So it gives them access to the edges of the pond. So in this garden, if we look at the situation, uh, it's only about four or five metres across, only a small garden, and the pond I'm going to look to put in here is going to be about two and a half metres long by about two metres wide. Uh, if you go much smaller than this, it gets a little bit difficult because your optimum depth, if you like, uh, of actual water body, you want to aim to get to about two feet or 60 centimetres deep, which will just be fantastic for anything like overwintering frogs uh, who do actually, some of them, uh, hibernate at the bottom of a pond and actually absorb oxygen through the mud. Quite amazing how they do, but they do. Uh, and by having that depth, you um, you run less risk of the water body itself actually freezing completely over if we do get a cold winter. Uh, so of course, by having that, you know it may just get a skimming of ice across the top. Uh, and of course, if you do get any ice in the winter, you know, just kind of pour not boiling water, but just sort of you know. Uh, room temperature water over the top of the pond just to melt a little bit of the ice because if you try and crack the ice then it can actually damage the uh, the, the frogs and any um, amphibians that are in the pond it can damage their hearing uh, so that's you know uh, we'll look at again the maintenance a bit later on and how to look after your pond but as I say in this instance you want to aim for a couple of feet depth if you can uh, or three foot is better toads for example prefer deeper water three to four feet so if you can do a pond that's five six seven meters by four or five meters across and get to three foot then all the better uh, but the key is going to be how you shape your pond which we'll look at shortly uh, so as I say in this situation I'm going to look to put the pond right in the middle of the garden almost just off center from uh, where there's a path down the side of the garden and sort of overlap it into the edge of the border where we've already got some existing plants that are, are pretty good for wildlife and already attracting the, the bees uh, into the garden things such as We've got some Welsh poppies behind me which are, are lovely, they've naturalised and also a stinking iris or, or gladden as some people know it which is uh, just coming into flower now and looking fantastic. Uh, so I want to incorporate those around the margins of the pond but also introduce a lot more wildflowers which again we'll look at in time. So I think now the best thing is to mark the pond out and see where we're going to you know, play around with the shape and, and if you can try and get some irregularity to your shape. Uh, I find sort of kidney shape or ovals are best uh, because they enable you to get shallow margins quite easily. Avoid sharp edges because it just becomes awkward when you put, come to putting your liner in. Um, but again, so you know, the best way of doing this is by getting some hose pipe or some string or some canes, marking it out on the floor, see what you can give yourself in terms of an area for the pond and don't tuck it away in the corner of the garden make it a central feature that's my advice because the amount of people that contact me afterwards and say I cannot believe how many hours I actually sit by this pond and enjoy all the wildlife so make it a focal point don't just tuck it away um, and in my eyes like I say they are really a key structure and a feature within the garden uh, so once you've got your actual position of your pond you, know, you, you roughly know where you, you want to put it like I say, get yourself a hose, lay that out on the ground, then you can sort of go around the edge of the hose with a spade uh, and mark where you're going to start digging. So we'll do that now and uh, we'll look at what shapes we come up with and then we can get on with the digging. So that's the pond marked out. I've had official approval from the client and you can see that I've had uh, some or I've included some nice gentle curves and edges to the pond no sharp corners or anything like that and that will just pay dividends when we come to shaping the pond and creating the shallow margins uh, that are going to be great for the wildlife so I'm going to start by going around the edges of the hose now spading down to mark the, hose, the edge of the pond and I can take the hose away and start stripping the turf and then get on with the digging So that's the turf stripped off 
And it's now that I'd like to talk to you for a moment about soils, because soils play a big part in the creation of a wildlife pond. Now, for those of you that have maybe undertaken a pond project in the past, uh, underneath your liner, you've probably tried to protect it by using a layer of fleece or underlay or building sand, for example, to stop any sharp objects or stones or bits of glass puncturing your liner when it's full of water and the, the pressure of that water has pressed it into the ground. Uh, and that's fine and it works and I've seen many a good pond uh, that's full of life uh, created in this manner. However, the ponds that I design and build are kind of the next step up from that and they're an added layer of protection because if liners are left in the, uh, the way we've just described and the liner is on display, what you can find is over time the UV rays from the sun can actually degrade the liner and it becomes very brittle and of course then liable to get a puncture or you know maybe a heron might sort of put a hole in the side of it or something uh, and of course the last thing you want is your beloved pond of many years to suddenly get a puncture and you find yourself having to rip everything out and start again so to combat that the way I uh, design and build these ponds is by putting another layer of fleece on top of the liner and then actually putting subsoil back in on top of that fleece to sort of four or six inches now, for those of you that are thinking this is a bit of an alien concept, it's absolutely fine. When I first heard about it many, many years ago, uh, it took me a bit to understand it as well. But um, by backfilling on top of a layer of fleece, you're actually creating a very natural medium and, and effectively you are creating the most natural environment that you possibly can for the wildlife. Uh, and it's great as well, of course, because by having that subsoil to plant your plants directly into from any level throughout the pond, whether it's your lilies lower down or around your margins, you know, some of your uh, sort of water mints and brook limes, those sort of things, um, then, you know, it's really a very natural way of creating a wildlife pond. So, of course, it negates uh, the use of any baskets or the need for any baskets to plant your lilies in and things that need to go uh, in the bottom of the pond. So it's a very natural look. Um, and not only that, that subsoil layer and the layer of fleece underneath it then protects the liner, of course, from the UV rays, um, meaning that in theory, the ponds that you, if you follow these guidelines, they should really last indefinitely, um, unless you've got a very overambitious uh, badger or heron coming to the side of the pond, uh, they really should last a long, long time. Now, when I say subsoils, I'm talking about the type of soil that's found underneath what most of us gardeners uh, would refer to as the top soils or the nice soils that we want in our herbaceous borders uh, to give lots of life to our uh, herbaceous perennials to, you know, to make sure they produce lots of uh, vegetation and flowers for bees and butterflies and moths that we all love um, which is great and of course you want that fertility in those borders however in a pond uh, you actually want the opposite you want poor soils uh, hence the, uh, the phrase subsoil um, because that then enables the uh, the quality of the water to be kept uh, fairly well a very good quality but the the uh, actual fertility of the pond to be very low because you don't want high fertility in the pond as I said before uh, with leaf litter potentially from when that falls in from trees in the autumn that rotting vegetation can really add fertility and turn the water black and, and really do uh, or have some detrimental effects to the wildlife and the plants. So by having these poor subsoil layers, uh, you've got no risk of there being too high of a fertility. Now the soil that I've got here, which underneath the turf is still very fertile, and to find those subsoil layers, you need to dig down, depending on where you are in the country and depending on what ground you're on, uh, anywhere between four inches to a foot before you actually find uh, a distinct change in colour. Um, and that may be to normally sort of more orangey browns rather than the sort of the rich sort of darker uh, and blacker colours that we're used to in our herbaceous borders. So I'm going to start digging about where I am now and when you do start digging your pond start where you uh, believe is going to be the deepest point. If you start around the edges quite often you can find you dig too deep too early on and then of course you're creating you know quite steep sides which is very detrimental for wildlife things like hedgehogs unfortunately uh, a lot die each year through dropping into a swimming pool because of course it's very steep sided and they can't get out so when you're designing and, and installing your wildlife pond you want to make sure the edges are all shallow and they've got nice gentle gradients and that way it's easier for life to get in and out uh, and it looks natural as well and it's actually these shallower parts that can quite often be the most prolific in terms of wildlife uh, within your pond so things such as your tadpoles will love it because 
these shallow bays, and, and I'm going to put a, a shallow bay at this one end here. Um, warm up a lot quicker in the early morning sun, so for insects and uh, you know tadpoles and things starting out their day, that's where they're going to want to be to warm up quicker rather than the deeper water, which of course will take longer to warm up. So these shallow margins have a vital role um, for, for so much wildlife without the or throughout the course of the year. And of course, by creating those shallow margins as well, and as you'll see with the addition of some cobbles around this side of the pond, it's going to create a fantastic bird bath. So, you know, it's okay, we can think of ponds as attracting things such as dragonflies, damselflies, uh, frogs, newts, and the sort, but actually, ponds can be a vital resource for our native birds, uh, for bathing and for drinking. So, along with that, I would start with digging yourself a little uh, lip around the edge of four to six inches, and I'll explain, explain that a little bit further on, uh, but I'm gonna start digging now, and the tools you're going to need probably are a good sturdy spade, a shovel, a pickaxe depending on the soil, uh, a level which we'll talk about later uh, and a bucket or a wheelbarrow to get rid of your soil. So I'm going to start digging now and we'll come on to the profiles in a little bit.